So we're starting off again. You know, the, today, I want to just kind of re, remind you where we have been, uh, especially for those who are new. We have been going through the book of Leviticus uh, these past couple months, and uh, we're looking at a book that helps us to answer how a sinful people can worship and approach a holy God, how we can be in fellowship with a God who is completely other and what he does to bring us into that fellowship, bring us into relationship with him. And we've looked at the, the sacrifices which help to, to do that. We've looked at the priesthood who are the, the people that help you know, to bring into that, that go-between and how we are ultimately a priesthood of believers now in Christ Jesus. And we've looked at the idea of cleanliness versus uncleanliness and how that, that can keep us from the presence of God, but what God does to bring us back over and over and provides for us and what he's done for us in Christ Jesus to forever bring us cleansing in the last couple of weeks, we've been looking into what's known as the holiness code, this idea of being set apart for God. What does it look like as followers of Yahweh God, the, the God of the Old Testament, who's also the God of the New Testament that we see revealed greater in Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit? What does that look like to be set apart, to be completely other than what the world says so that we might live that out to a world that's desperately in need of the gospel? And we've looked at a couple of things. That the first week, we looked at the idea of our sex, right? That our sex has to do with something that is a holy thing. We are how we live in light of the very creation of who we are as male and female from Genesis chapter 2, how we live that out. And it can be a glorification to God. And then last week, we looked in chapter 19, and at the, the, one of the most famous verses, probably in all of the Old Testament, is the idea of you must love your neighbor what? As yourself. And we looked last week at this idea that, and we went all the way to the New Testament. Jesus, what, what, what we like to do a lot of times, we like to ask the question when it comes to loving my neighbor, I like to ask the question, what? Who is my neighbor? That's my inclination to say, out here, I can point out here, who is my neighbor? Neighbor, 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 neighbor. But it also allows me to go, not neighbor, not neighbor, not neighbor. And I can define when I'm looking out this way, who is my neighbor? And therefore, who do I have to love? Who's not my neighbor, therefore, who do I not have to love, right? But Jesus switches it around in the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. He says, it's not who is my neighbor. He asks the question to the guy, what? Who proved to be a neighbor? And it takes the finger from pointing outward to a finger pointing inward and saying, am I being a neighbor or not? And what I wanted to do these next three weeks was we're going to kind of pause in chapter 19 of Leviticus, and we're going to just kind of like take a springboard up out of this chapter. And we're going to look for three weeks. We're going to look at a why, the why of neighboring, basically, all right? We're going to look at the why of neighboring. We're going to look at the what of neighboring and the how of neighboring. Um, and so we, you know, I think the, the importance in the first thing is, is the why, because just like good children do, when, they're, when we're asked to, they're asked to do something, the very first question they always ask is what? Why? Just like we do. We do the same thing. Doesn't matter who tells us, we want to know the why, because the why is what gives me the motivation, what gives me the foundation for doing what I'm called to do. And if I'm called to be a neighbor to other people, I need to first understand why. Why is this an important thing? Is this, and is it just a basically a kind of a suggestion thing? Or is this something that is in the very root of being a follower of God? Does this have something to do with it? And that's what we're gonna look at today. And so what, like what we're gonna do these three weeks, like I said, this first one, I'm gonna begin with the why. I want us to see a view of who our God is and his desires for mankind by looking at a pattern. What I wanna do today, it's gonna be a little bit different than what we've done probably, I think this is my first sermon is kind of like this since I've been here, is we're gonna take a bird's eye view of the scriptures as a whole from Genesis on and look at an idea, a pattern that follows throughout scripture, I think that gives us a peek into the mindset of God, the mindset of who he is and what he calls his people to do. And you know, I think it's, we're going to see it over and over. He calls us, but fascinatingly, you're going to see over and over that we as people fail at doing yet again and again what he's called us to do. And yet, he keeps calling us to do that very thing. And so I call this sermon, it's called Spread Out, all right, because this is what the people were called to do from the very beginning, and it continues to this day. So I'm laying out that this is the theme, this is what it's about. So it's about spreading out, going out and filling the earth. 
bringing God's glory throughout the earth. So I'm going to lay it out to you on the front end, and you know where we're going. Because we're going to do about a 15 verse or sections of verses, things. We're going to be kind of rapid fire walking through. Not a lot of notes, okay? Not a lot of charts, not a lot of things. I just want you to sit in the moment and sit and listen and look at how God works in and through his people, both for what he calls us to, but also our response, how we respond well, but also how we can respond poorly. I think this is how God operates. Some people get it, some people don't. But I want to find where this finds it, the why finds its very foundation, where it finds its, you know, the senses is back in Leviticus 19. We'll put this up here, is how it starts out. This chapter on loving your neighbor and loving the foreigner as yourself starts off with this. And it says that Yahweh spoke to Moses and he said, speak to the whole congregation of the Israelites and tell them what? You must be holy. Why? Because I, Yahweh, your God, am holy holy. This is the very why of being a neighbor. If we miss this part, we've missed it all, and we're just simply kind of living things out. We're being the kid that, or the parent that just says, do this, and the kid says, why? You say what? Because I said so, right? And it's nothing more than just because I said so. If I do not understand who it is that we are following. God says to the people, he says, you are to be set apart because you understand who I am. Right, And this is just kind of a reminder from last week. We had this up, but it's this reminder. Yahweh says it 16 times, this phrase, I am Yahweh your God, is said throughout this chapter. 16 times tells me something what? That it's what? It's important, right? And he reminds them 16 times who he is. Why? Because loving our neighbor finds its very foundation in understanding the character of the God that we serve. Okay? And so what I'm gonna share with you today, this is just a pattern, and I'm sure it's not, it's not original to me. I didn't come up with it. I'm sure a thousand people have said it before me. There's 2,000 years of history that I'm sure I didn't come up with this. But the Lord showed me this a few years ago. And uh, I just, I want to share it with you today. So we're just going to kind of take a bird's eye view. We're going to walk through scripture, okay? And we're going to start all the way back in Genesis chapter 1. And I want you to see this pattern of a God who calls people to spread out, right? Okay, you ready? Let's jump into this. Genesis chapter one, all the way back to the very beginning. God creates the heavens and the earth, right? He creates all of these things. He creates the sky and the light and the land and the sea and the air and all these different things. And then he fills them all with creatures. And ultimately, he fills them with what? Fills the earth with people, right? Created, he created humankind in his what? image, right? He created people in his image. And basically what that means simply is he created us to be little image bearers. Not that we're going to physically look like him, like God has arms and legs and, you know, hair and things like that. It's an image bearer in the sense of saying God puts mankind on earth in order to be his representative on this earth as if he were here himself. So he's going to say to us, This is who I am, and this is what I want you to be as humanity. And the very first command, anybody know what the very first command of God is? It's right here. He says to the people, he says what? God bless them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. There's that sex part we talked about, right? Right? See, it comes back. always comes back. No, I'm just kidding. Fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, when it comes to the earth, were Adam and Eve supposed to stay in the garden? We might, sometimes we think they, they were supposed to stay in the garden and the, the curse, you know, the fall actually just, they, you know, they, now they have to live out. I don't think so. From before anything else, God says, I want you to fill the earth. Go out and populate and spread out and go throughout the whole earth and be my people, be my image bearers everywhere, wherever you go. And he says, what, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creature that moves on the ground. So this is what I want you to do. You are going to be my representative and everything that's under your care, Adam and Eve, and all humankind that's going to come after you, everything is going to rise and it's going to fall based on your rulership and your ability to spread out and rule over all creation, okay? We got that? That's the foundation. Well, how do we do? How do we do as spreaders of God's kingdom, God's glory, God's rule? Well, we don't have to go very far to see how well we do. You jump all, just all the way so far to Genesis chapter 6, okay? 
You see, by Genesis chapter 6, you see a few different things. Basically, you start to see, you see the very first sibling, or not siblings, you have the, the offspring of Adam and Eve. You see two siblings, Cain and Abel, and what happens? We already see the first what? The first murder. We see a man named Lamech who comes not too long after who boasts that he's just, he's so wicked. He says, you know what, I'm, I, I will kill people just for simply striking me on the face. He, and basically saying, this is how much I'm going to rule over people, but I'm going to do it in the wrong way. You see in chapter 6, at the beginning, there's some weird stuff that goes on. I'm not going to get into a lot of details. About, it talks about sons of God, right? These, these maybe angelic beings of some sort that come and have sexual relationships with women and that they have these, the, you know, these, these special creatures that come from this. It's some kind of crazy stuff. And it's, it's outside of created order, right? All this stuff. And you get to basically Genesis chapter 6, and God's going to say something very important about what has already happened in just simply a few uh, years down the road. Look with me, and you, know, you see this in verse 11. God looks at everything that's been going on, just a few generations, and he says this. He says, the earth was ruined in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with something. Mankind had done a good job of filling the earth, but what had they filled the earth with? Violence. And God saw the earth, and indeed it was ruined, not just mankind, but what was ruined? All living creatures on the earth were sinful. And that's weird to me. You go, wait, the, the animals were sinful? The animals were, un, you know, like something. That, but you start to understand what was mankind given from the very beginning to rule over. And he says, everything under your rule will be affected by you. And God said, he looks and says, all violence has filled the earth because how quickly we have turned from God's mandate to fill it with his glory, to fill it with his rule. And we fill it with, with violence. And so God said to Noah, we know, right, this, is, this is Noah, he's the one guy. He says, I've decided that all living creatures must die for the earth, here it is again, is filled with violence because of them. Now I am about to destroy all the earth. Everything pretty much was ruined and God's heart was interestingly, you don't see, we think often a lot of times, we think God in this point is what? What's the common word of his emotion from this time with the flood? What's a common reaction we think of? Anybody? Wrath, anger, heatedness. I challenge you something. Go find that anywhere in the scripture in Genesis. You won't find it. You won't find anger. You won't find wrath. What you will find from God is what? A sadness. You will find God's heart is broken because he sees the earth is filled with things that he called it not to be filled with. And so he must, basically what he does is he turns the earth over back to chaos. That's what the earth wanted. That's what the people wanted. And he turns them over and lets the waters that once covered the earth, right, from the very beginning, Genesis 1, what does he do? He pulls away and he allows the mankind to get everything they want and water refills the earth. Chaos reconsumes things so it can start over. And then he restarts things, though, with Noah. Interestingly, in chapter 9, though, Noah, he comes to Noah after the ark Right, the, the water recedes, everything is wiped off the earth, and they're starting anew with Noah and the creatures. And what does God come to Noah and say to him the very first thing after he comes out of the ark? He says in chapter 9, he said, Then God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, What? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Does that sound familiar? It's what was back in Genesis chapter 1. God says, We're going to try this again. Okay? You guys did a really poor job the first time. I'm gonna, we're going to try it again. How do we do? Well, it only, takes two, you know, it only takes two chapters, and one of those chapters is just a list of people, so it really doesn't go anywhere. Chapter 11, we get to a famous story of the Tower of what? Babel. Look with me in verse, now, it's interesting, if you, uh, verse four is where we're going to start. This Tower of Babel, often we think of the whole point, the whole issue here of Babel is what? They build a tower and they want to reach up into heavens, right? And, we th and like often the common thing of saying the problem with Babel is, the Tower of Babel, is that they wanted to try to get to God, right? But I don't think that's the major problem. I think that's a catalyst into showing what the major problem is. Look with me in verse 4. Here's the problem. Why did they build it? 
verse 4 and 11. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops into heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. They want to be known, right? But otherwise, here's their fear. Otherwise, what? We will be scattered across the face of the entire earth. What does mankind already trying to do? Go in the face of God who calls them to fill the earth and go spread out. They're already in open rebellion yet again. And how do I know that God cares about this? If I look, look down verses eight, eight and nine. So Yahweh scattered them from there across the face of the entire earth and they stopped building the city. This is why it's called Babel. Why? Because there Yahweh confused the language of the entire world and from there Yahweh scattered them across the face of the entire earth. What, you, what was God worried about? Doing what I've called you to do. Spread out, go out, take my name, take my glory and fill the earth. And what are people wanting to consistently do? Come back in, build a name for ourselves. Open rebellion. And so what does God do? He try and, and like, it's almost, it's not really that this is God's plan B, C. It's not that way, but God has another plan for what mankind is wanting to do. And you see chapter 12, God does what? Chapter 12, verses one through three, he grabs a man named Abram. Listen to this. He says, go out from your country. What? Go out from your country. Spread, Right? Your relatives and your father's house to the land I will show you. There I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will exemplify divine blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, but the one who treats you lightly I must curse. What? All of the families where? Of the entire earth will be blessed, will bless one another by your name. What is God concerned about going through Abraham? A blessing that's going to what? Fill the earth. You see it? He says, I want you, your blessing, my blessing to you to fill the whole earth. Will they fulfill this charge? Well, yes and some no in there, right? The people of God, the, the Israelites are going to some and some not. A little side note, and let me show you just a little way. This is a funny thing that actually I, I'm thinking, it's just like almost like not really a, uh, a theological thing, but it's a funny thing even down to the point of when the Israelites are given the land, three chapters after this, God's gonna tell Abraham, this is the land I'm gonna give you. And he, he takes the borders and he actually kind of lays them out. Let me put them up here, actually. Go, go ahead and put those, those borders um, up. And this is like a little map. Believe it or not, actually, this is approximate. Okay, this is not a definite, but this is kind of in, obviously, Saudi Arabia and Iran, and those didn't exist back then. But God tells Abram, he says, I'm, the land I'm going to give you goes all the way in the west over here in Egypt to the great river in, in the Nile, all the way to the Euphrates, which is going down through Iraq there, and everything in between up into Turkey, up into Syria. But it's funny and, and it actually, he repeats it in Joshua chapter one. When they're finally going to go into the land, God tells them and repeats to Joshua, this is the land that I'm gonna give you. You know what the Israelites actually finally ended up conquering? Go ahead and put that up there. About that much. That's really about all they ever did. You know why? Because they got in the land and what do they do? They settled, they stayed. What are they supposed to be doing? Taking the blessings of Yahweh to the nations. But where do they stop? Right there. And now this is, this is, I mean, if you think about historically, I mean, all this over here, Babylonian, all this over this way, Egyptian, up into to Europe and things, this is like the, the hotbed of society. Everything must come through this area. All roads, every trade comes right through this area, but all they cared about, they're like, we're satisfied with this little partial land and we'll stay right here when they should have gone fully out. It's fascinating. They still don't do it. Even at Solomon's height, the, the height of the, the Israelites' kingdom, this is as far as they get. And speaking of Solomon, let's turn to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, it's fascinating. Whenever the temple is built, and what's the point of the temple? We've been looking at this a lot. What's the point of the temple? A place where what? Where people could come and be in the presence of God, right? God's presence with his people in, in order to be a blessing to the whole world, you must open this up to 
the entire world. Do you think they understood that? I think Solomon understood that. Look at verse 30, uh, 32 in chapter 6. This is Solomon's words as he's dedicating the temple. He says, foreigners who do not belong to your people Israel will what? Will come from a distant land because of your great reputation and your ability to accomplish mighty deeds. They will come and direct their prayers towards this temple. Then listen from your heavenly dwelling place and answer all the prayers of the foreigners. Then all of the nations of the earth will, be, will acknowledge your reputation, obey you like your people Israel do, and recognize that this temple I built belongs to you. What does Solomon understand about Yahweh God? That all, excuse me, all of the nations need to find their hope in Yahweh. But it, it is a fascinating thing, though. What do they, what does even Solomon see it as? How are they going to hear? By coming. Isn't it fascinating? Even in the inauguration of the temple, you see it's about coming. They still aren't about going. And before Solomon even finishes, what does he start doing? He starts going out and he finds wives from other nations and gods from other nations and he brings them in and he builds his own kingdom. He builds up walls and he builds up all these things, chariots and horses, things that God said not to. In other words, what is he doing to his kingdom? He is bringing it in on itself and keeping ultimately what? People out. Instead of going out, instead of sending people to the nations. And what happens within, by his death, the kingdom split and from that point on, what do you start seeing? Even that small partial of land, you start seeing a shrinking and a shrinking and smaller and smaller. Eventually, it even gets down to just Jerusalem because the Assyrians come in and hold them up in just in Jerusalem. And then finally, at the end of the history of the Old Testament, what happens even to the temple? It's what? It's destroyed. The means by which the people could come to know the Lord is destroyed. Why? Look real quick at Lamentations chapter 2. Lamentations chapter 2, this is uh, from the prophet Jeremiah, okay? He says, let me get there myself. He says to the people in verses 1 and 6, he says, Alas, Yahweh has covered daughter Zion with his anger. He has thrown down the splendor of Israel from heaven to earth, who did not protect his temple and display it when he displayed his anger. In verse 6, he destroyed his temple as if it were a vineyard. He destroyed his appointed meeting place, and Yahweh made those in Zion forget both the festivals and the Sabbaths, in his fierce anger, he had spurned both king and priest. The people forget who Yahweh was in their history, and they forget that they do not honor him. What does he do? He destroys the temple, but there was a purpose to this. There was a purpose to his destroying the temple, because what else happened to the people when the temple was destroyed? What do the Babylonians do? What do the Assyrians do? What do they do? Funny, they come in and spread the people out. Interestingly, God's judgment upon the people when they don't do it themselves is to kick them out into the nations. And in Jeremiah 29, God actually gives a bit of a, a, a kind of a, a thing that's going, hey, I've sent you out here, by the way. And this is one of those great places where everybody loves to read at uh, graduations and give to graduates and stuff, you know, in the context here. You know, the, the, I know the plans I have for you, right? That one, the famous one in that. But let's look at what the context is there. God says, I've sent you out into Babylon, into these places to do what? Look at verse, tw uh, verse chapter 29, verses four through seven. He says, Yahweh, God of Israel, who rules over all, says to all those he sent into exile, to Babylon, where? From Jerusalem. I kicked you out. He says, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, Eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and allow your daughters to get married so that they too can have sons and daughters. Grow in number. Do not dwindle away. In other words, God's saying what? About your stay in Babylon, you're going to what? You're going to be here for a while, okay? So go ahead and buy a house, have kids, have some grandkids while you're at it, right? Because you're going to be here for a while. Actually, he says 70 years. And then verse 7, which we, if, if you know what for the city is, that comes from this, right? Work to see that the city where I sent you as exiles, what? Enjoys peace and prosperity. Pray to Yahweh for it 
for as it prospers, you will prosper. Where do you think this idea of prosperity and going out comes from? It comes from who God is. He says, it doesn't matter where I'm sending you, even in punishment, you are going out to be a blessing, to be a neighbor. If you think about this, being a neighbor to the people that you live around. For when you make it prosper outside of yourself, you will prosper. He says, in other words, be a good neighbor. What about, what about the prophets? You know, we, we the famous, probably the most famous of the prophets or whatever is, uh, we, you know, is the one, we always learn it in, uh, in Sunday school, right? Jonah, 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 in the well, 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 right? You know, what's Jonah about? Jonah is about, it's a picture of who? It's a picture of who? Israel, of the people of God, and God is calling them to go and do something. Look at verse, chapter 1. Jonah's, and he calls to Jonah from the very beginning. He says in Jonah 1, 1, he says, Yahweh said to Jonah, son of Amittai, go immediately to Nineveh. Nineveh was the enemy. It's, it's about as enemy as you can get to the Israelites at this time. Wicked people. They, they were good fishermen, and what they are known for is actually filleting people and keeping them alive to where they would fillet their skin and keep them alive to torture them. I mean, these were really bad people. And God says what? Go to them the large capital city, and announce judgment against the people because their wickedness has come to my attention. So God says, Jonah, you're in Israel. What do I want you to do? Go out. Take my message out. What does Jonah do? Instead, Jonah immediately headed off the other way to Tarshish, right? To escape from the commission of Yahweh. And he traveled to Joppa and found a merchant ship heading to Tarshish. So Jonah is a picture of the Israelites of saying, God says, go this way, and what do they do? Go that way. And we know this, if you know the story, God, you know, the well comes and they throw him in, and the well eat, you know, it's actually, you know, it's probably a well, not a fish. You know, it, it probably eats him for a little time and it vomits him back up. In chapter three, God comes to Jonah again. It's almost kind of like, all right. You ready to listen again? He says to him, verse one, he says, Yahweh said to Jonah a second time, go immediately to Nineveh, that large city, and proclaim to it the message I tell you. In other words, does the message change? Nope. But now Jonah went immediately to Nineveh as Yahweh had said, okay? And it was an, it was an enormous city, required three days to walk through it. When Jonah began to enter the city, one day's walk, he announced the end of the 40 days and it'll be overthrown. But what happens? Jump down to verse or sorry, verse five, uh, the people of Nineveh believed God and they declared a fast and put on sackcloth, a sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Jonah goes out and does what? Shares the message and what do they do? They actually repent. The message spreads. Jump down to verse eight. Every person and animal must put on sackcloth and must cry earnestly to God. Every person and animal? Why? Because the wickedness, the violence had spread, Right? Earnestly you know, cry earnestly to God, and everyone must turn from their evil way of living from this violence that they do. You see these things, they show up a lot. Who knows, perhaps God might be willing to change his mind and relent from the fierce anger so that we may not die. And when God saw their actions, they turned from their evil way of living, and God, what, relented concerning the judgment he had threatened them with, and he did not destroy them. The message goes out finally, reluctantly, but... Did Jonah do this? Did, I mean, Jonah's like, oh, man, he's a good guy now, right? I mean, he, he, I mean like, he did what God, he's like, gung-ho. Let's keep reading. Verse 1, this displeased Jonah terribly, and he became very angry. What displeased Jonah? That God relented. He doesn't want to be a neighbor to them. He doesn't want to see them prosper. He doesn't want to see anything good happen to them. He prayed to Yahweh and said, oh, Yahweh, this is just what I thought would happen when I was in my own country. This is what I, why I tried to, be, to prevent by attempting to escape to Tarshish, like God didn't know, because I knew that you were gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in mercy, and one who relents concerning threatening judgment. And he even goes on to say, just kill me. I mean, it's just like, 
But this is the major theme of the Old Testament as time and time again, God's saying, I want you to go out. I want you to spread. I want you to, to take this message and be a neighbor to all around you. Why? Because this is who I am. This is what I'm about is going out and being a neighbor. And time and time and time and time again, it doesn't happen. But the New Testament's coming, right? And New Testament's totally different. We're totally different come New Testament, right? Well, let's look real quick. What is Jesus' last call? What are Jesus' last words? Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. This is post-resurrection. Jesus has given his last words, and he says to them what? Go and make disciples where? Of all nations. In other words, you got to go out to take my message, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, this is where you're going to go. And then in Acts 1.8, he further says, you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. In other words, you're going to start where you are and you're going to spread out. You're going to spread out. You're going to spread out. And they do a great job of it, right? Well, and it's funny. Now, don't get me wrong. What happens in Acts chapter 2? The Holy Spirit shows up. Peter preaches like the best you know, sermon ever. 3,000 people come to faith that day. You imagine being, like, being involved in that? That would be amazing. You get 3,000 converts in a day. But you go on to chapter 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7, and there's an interesting little thing that's going on in the book of Acts. Where are the people of God by the end of chapter 7? Any guess? Anybody want to venture to guess? Where are the people by the end of chapter 7? They're still in Jerusalem. What have they not done? They haven't gone anywhere. They're still, and this is with the Holy Spirit. This is after Jesus, and we still have this sense of, I'm going to stay here, and I want everybody, because what's right down the road in Jerusalem still? The temple. Let's have everybody Come here. This is the way it's always worked. Let's have them all come here, and then we'll preach to them, right? And what does what does Jesus do? I think it's a very interesting thing. If you look at John uh, at, the, at Acts chapter eight, right at the end of seven, something happens to guy, guy Stephen. What happens to Stephen? He gets stoned and killed. Right? He's the first martyr. Now look at verse one in chapter eight. Okay. Um, you know, eight one. It says, and what do we got? We're going through uh, one and four. He says, now on that day a great persecution began against the church where in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were forced to scatter. Why? Because they weren't scattering on their own, right? Throughout the regions of interestingly where Judea and Samaria. What did Jesus said? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. But verse 4, now those who had been forced to scatter went around proclaiming the good news of the word. They finally, they finally are getting in, and it took God striking them and and putting some type of a persecution against them to actually kick them out of the house. It's like the kid that's 25, it's like, get out of the basement and go live your life. Go do something. You got to kick him out. We're, We're no different. Sometimes we need a little kick in the pants to do what we need to be, we've been called to do. And over and over, we as humans forget that our God is one who loves to spread out and fill the earth with his glory, and we are called to be what? Just like him. Be holy as I am holy. And he calls us to be that neighbor. So here, here's the thing. I think, why are we to be a neighbor? Why are we to do this? It's because this is who he is in his very being. And I want to look at this real quick. I'm going to go to Luke chapter 15. We're not going to do a deep dive in this, but I'm going to kind of end with Luke chapter 15. I want to show you three different ways real quick of the character of who our God is. Jesus shows us who he is and what he is willing to do in order to be a neighbor to others, in order to be what God has called them to do, to love their neighbor as themselves. And then we're going to see yet another picture of who we are. Real quick, follow with me. And so the context here in verses 1 and 2, Jesus is eating with who? The wrong people. He's eating with 
Who? Sinners. How dare he? He's eating with the wrong people. And so Jesus, I love it, he always just said, yeah, let me tell you a story. So Jesus, verse three, told them this parable. Which of one of you, if he has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, would not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go look for the one that's lost until he finds it? Then when he has found it, he places it on his shoulders, what? Rejoicing. Returning home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors and tells them, rejoice with me because I found my sheep that was lost. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need to repent. Jesus tells us our God is willing to what? He's willing to leave the 99 that are safe and happy and well-fed and protected to go after the one. And when that one is found, he will what? He rejoices. Furthermore, he says, or what woman, if she has 10 silver coins, these are dowry, you know, dowry things for her you know, marriage, and loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search thoroughly until she finds it, and then when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I've found the coin I've lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the very presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. And it's interesting that in the presence of angels, a lot of times we like to think he's actually saying the angels are rejoicing. No. A good Jewish way of not ever kind of saying God's name wrong is to kind of infer about him. Who's doing the rejoicing in heaven here? When a one. God is doing the rejoicing about one. This is who he is in the very presence of all of the heavenly beings. There is rejoicing over one is lost. And it said, Jesus says, our God will tear everything apart in order to find the one who is lost. And in the presence of the angels, there's rejoicing. Not only that, he says, and then Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. In other words, if dad's still alive and you ask for your inheritance back then, what are you in effect telling your dad? You're dead to me because the inheritance doesn't come until dad is gone. He says, I want my inheritance now, dad. You're dead to me. And not, and not only that, he goes off. We know the story. He goes off with the prodigal son. He spends all his money. He's in poverty. He's eaten from pigs. And I mean, all this stuff, just everything debased. I mean, he is as low as he could possibly get, right? And he comes back. Jump down to verse 20. He comes back and he got up and he went to his father. I love this. But while he was still a long way off, as he's walking down the road, who's standing there looking? I love it. While he was still a long way off from home, his father saw him and his heart went out to him. And he ran. He made himself undignified he girded up his lungs. He made himself undignified and ran after his son. And he hugged him and he kissed him. Our God is one who is willing to make himself look foolish and in order to welcome the one who lost. And verse, what else? Jump down to 23. What does he do? He says, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate because the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. God is just like the one who looks after the sheep. He is one who will go after the coin, and he is the one that will go after the lost son. He will debase himself. He will look, make himself look foolish by showing the grace of going out and making a difference in those who are lost. This is who our God is, Jesus says. This is who my Father is. But the story, unfortunately, doesn't end there, does it? There's another son that's been sticking around, right? I think this is where it comes to us. We've seen three times the character of God. He spreads out to seek what was lost, but you and I, just like the Pharisees, often are just like the older brother in this story. Look at, he comes and he's like, he comes in from the field, he's like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Verse 28, he says, but the older son became angry and refused to go in, and his father came out and appealed to him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've worked like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your commands, yet you have, given, you have never even given me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, ooh, ooh, this son of yours, you ever said that? Your child, right? You ever said that, parents? Your kid did this. This son of yours came back 
who has devoured your assets with prostitutes and killed the fat. You've killed the fatted calf for him? What's this guy worried about? Just like the Pharisees, he's only caring about himself. He only cares about his wants. We only care about our wants, our comforts, our righteous deeds that we think make us look so good. We care about our celebrations that should be had. Our desire is to stay in and say, what's in it for me? And he's a poor, poor older brother. Because fascinatingly, if the inheritance went to the younger brother, what happened to the other part of the inheritance, the other two-thirds? Huh? Nope, not still with dad. If the younger brother got his and dad has already split it up, who has the inheritance? Who, who does all of the stuff that the father belongs to the father, whose is it? It's the older brother. It all belongs to him because dad, and even though dad's there, who should have been the one on the road welcoming in the younger brother as he comes? The older brother. Why? Because it all belongs to him anyway. But what does the dad do? He's sharing the, the ring and the fatted calf. And the brother's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. In other words, you're spending my money, dad, on somebody else that doesn't deserve it. Stop spending my money, dad. And dad's like, hold up a second. The father said to him, son, you're with me always. And everything that belongs to me is what? Yours. You, have you not realized this? It's all yours anyway. It was appropriate to celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and now he's found. You and I, we make poor older brothers a lot of times because we worry about ourselves. The Pharisees made very poor older brothers who should be about the riches that's given to them by their father to take them out and to be a blessing and to share it with those who do not have, even if they, what, don't deserve it. But here's the beauty. Is you know who's the true older brother? You know who's the good older brother? The one who has everything that his father possesses and is willing to share it with anyone that would come and ask? Uh, we, we have a true older brother in Jesus, our ultimate neighbor. The one who doesn't grasp for the things that would benefit him, but gives them up so that he might bring one back to his father. the one who's reckless in loving those who did not love him. Romans says that while we were yet not good, while we were not yet following after seeking God, but while we were yet what? Sinners. While we were uh, spitting in his face that Christ, what? Died for the ungodly. He's the ultimate brother who wants the earth filled with his father glory, father's glory and he wants his people to be the ones that still go and spread out. And not only that, but he empowers them with the ability to be his witnesses where worldwide. And he still, even when they fail, he still says, I'm going to make you go. I want you to go because this is who I am. I have come and I have sought you out. I have brought you near. And now I want you to do is I want you to go out and you bring other people near because they need to know me and I have chosen you. So why am I to be a neighbor to everyone around me? It's because I know who Yahweh is. I've seen his character throughout the scriptures. And I know that he's a God who loves to spread out. And he wants me to look just like him. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, he wants you to look just like him. He doesn't want us to stay. He doesn't want us at grace to stay in these walls. It's not about being in this building. He wants us to be a people that are going out, that are over our neighbor's fence and inviting them into our homes, about those who are co-workers on the other side of our office, that we invite them to lunch. We get to know them. We actually have a conversation more than sports or some TV show or something that's deeper than just surface things, but about life in Jesus. 
He wants us to be little image bearers on this earth, all just like he did all the way back in Genesis 1, to be his image bearers, to look just like him and to go out throughout the whole world, starting in our Jerusalem, starting very next door, and then spreading out from there. And he wants us to be a neighbor to whomever and to fill the earth with his glory. Amen? Oh, may grace be a community that is holy as our Father in heaven is holy. May we be a people that are about being a neighbor. Why? Because we know who he is. And we know what he is about. Amen? This is the why to being a neighbor. I, this is good. I, we haven't gotten to the what or the how yet. This is, this is enough, man. This is just the why. All right, let's pray. What we're going to do, we're going to pray. We're going to sing a song. And um, like I said, we're going to go get the kids. They're going to bring them in here in chaos. And then we're going to take the communion together. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, then we welcome you to come and take the bread and the cup with us. If you do not know him, then I, I just say, just sit and listen and watch. No need. No, don't, don't, don't take it in an improper manner. Just We, wa- we want to welcome you to be here. And just like our children, we want you to learn and see, why do we do this? This is why. This is why we take these elements together, because we know what Christ, Jesus Christ has done for us. And we take them in remembrance to worship him, because he is worthy. And so if you are a believer, we're going to ask that you would do that. So we're going to sing real quick. Let me pray. We'll sing, and then we'll do, I'll come back up, and we'll do this together, all right? And then we'll send you off. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a God who pursues. You are a God who does not leave your people without a hope. You do not allow us to merely fill this earth with violence and fill it with things that are of death, but you transform hearts. You transform people to be a people that fill this earth with your glory, and you call us to be a people that would make much of you. Uh, May we at Grace be a people that are our lives would be evidenced as some people that, that we go, what is different? It's because they love this God. They love this man, Jesus, this God man, and they want to make him known. Let us be a people that are about that, that this world would see that. Greenville would see that. The surrounding areas would see that, that you are the one that we adore. And that way we may go out to make your glory known. Father, we thank you your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your pursuit. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.